some fun with Crazy Taxi. It's party time. Let's have some fun. All right, let's go make some crazy money. Nine, nine, ninety-nine. Wow. Twenty years ago, to the day, the Dreamcast launched. And I'm going to talk about that today because of a couple of reasons. One, it's the day before my birthday. 20 years ago, September 9th, 1999, Sega launched the Dreamcast, which I'm not going to go into all the details about the Dreamcast and all that stuff, and a million people have done that, but they launched the Dreamcast, which was my favorite, and still is, my favorite console of all time. And there's a couple reasons for that. A lot of people will go, oh, Super Nintendo's my favorite uh, console of all time. Oh, the 64 was my favorite console of all time. You very, very rarely ever hear someone say the Dreamcast was my favorite console of all time. And there's a couple of reasons. One, because the Dreamcast had such a, lo- a short lifespan. It was only like two years. And unfortunately, it died a super early death because of PlayStation 2, because of uh, piracy and things like that. And it's kind of a bummer that it died because it did so many things extremely well. It was the first console to ever have online capability where you could actually hook the games up or the console up to um, a either at the time a dial up. It had a dial up modem built into it and you can actually remove that module and put in a broadband adapter if you had broadband, which mostly no one did at the time. But man, the Dreamcast is just such an incredible machine, and it doesn't. I I don't think it gets enough uh, recognition for all the things that it did. So, without further ado, I'm just gonna kind of talk about my experiences with the Dreamcast and one of my favorite memories. One of my favorite memories uh, with the Dreamcast was actually on launch day nine nine ninety nine, and it was the day before my birthday. It was the first day of uh, me starting high school. And I remember starting high school, coming home, and being super, super crazy excited for the Dreamcast. And what happened was my parents got, brought me home from school. I can't remember what time it was, but it was pretty late. You know, uh, we, I went to Capo Valley High School, and... That was a good chunk of the way away from our house. We lived in Kodo at the time. And so as soon as I got home from school, I got on my bike and I rode to Games for You. I rode my bike all the way from Kodo to Kaza, right smack dab in the middle of Kodo, to Games for You in uh, Mission Viejo, which is roughly, I just looked it up just a few minutes ago. It's a 10 mile bike ride. Um, from our house to games for you. And so I rode my bike 10 miles each way after school of the first day of high school just to go get this system. And I cannot believe how excited I was. I didn't even have that much money. I got, I think uh, it was a birthday present from my parents and I got Sonic Adventure and I don't think I even got anything else. I think I was just able to get Sonic Adventure. Oh, it was Sonic Adventure and Trick Style. And uh, those were the two launch games that I got. There's a lot of people who go, oh, yeah, Soul Calibur was my uh, launch game and Sonic sucks and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I was a kid. I was 14 turning 15 years old at that time. So... Like, I just, I, there was not really a whole lot for me to uh, really get excited about with fighting games. I've never been a fighting game player for the most part. I like them. I appreciate those types of games. Just not my forte, especially when I was a kid. And I mainly played games by myself, except for when I, when I, whenever I went over to Andrew's house. Um, but even then, I hated playing competitive games. I don't like competitive games all that much. I like co-op experiences. I like playing with someone instead of against someone. So I rode my bike all the way to Games for You. I had a backpack. I crammed that box, 
because I didn't want to throw away the box. That would be stupid. I crammed that box into my backpack and I rode my bike right back home and opened it up, hooked everything up and started playing Sonic Adventure. That was the game. I was a Sonic kid, you know? I loved the Sonic games on Genesis. I grew up with those games. And so uh, Sonic game in 3D was just insane to me. I remember reading all the Dreamcast magazine and um, uh, EGM and GamePro and all those game magazines uh, leading up to the launch. I remember EGM had a launch issue for Dreamcast and it had an orange cover with the Sega Swirl. And man, oh, I just remember reading that cover to cover, cover to cover, cover to cover over and over and over and over again, uh, leading up to the launch of the Dreamcast. And I remember being really excited for Sonic and being kind of not wary, but a little taken aback by what the game actually was. If you've ever played Sonic Adventure, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's very, 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 very different than uh, the original Sonic games, not just because it's in 3D, but just the the way the game is presented. It's a very Japanese-style game, and I was not used to that. I did not play um, JRPGs and stuff like that on the Super Nintendo and PlayStation. This was really my first real dive into the Japanese culture with this system. and. I remember playing Sonic Adventure and just going, what is this game? The The voice acting is weird. Sonic does not sound like Sonic. He sounds weird. Tails sounds like an eight-year-old girl. And it just had th- this weird cadence to everything. And voice acting was still in its infancy for video games back then. So I couldn't really fault it for that, nor did I really care. But I knew something was off. And if you go back and listen to those voice samples, the the localization's terrible the 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 lines that people read the way that they read them is just it's weird man it is awkward so what i did is i started playing this game and just being so caught off guard by how this game is very japanese in its nature and i was as a 14 year old kid Um, (laughs) I was not really expecting that from that game, but that game did so many cool things. It allowed you to play as not just Sonic, but Tails and Knuckles and, um, even Big the Cat and I think E-102 Gamma or something like that. I can't remember the robot's name, but you could play as multiple characters. You also had the VMU which was the memory card, but it had a display on it. And with Sonic Adventure, man, I remember taking that to school the next day, second day on my birthday, pulling out the VMU and trying to play the Chow uh, Garden games um, on the VMU in school during math and stuff like that. Maybe that's why I failed algebra three times in high school. <laughs> I don't know. But it was it's it's a really good memory of just coming home and just ripping that box open and and putting that stuff together. I love setting up electronic equipment. And so games was always something where you have the tangible feel of the cables, plugging them into the RCA outputs and stuff like that. It was at the time for a kid, you know, I was still young. It, it's, it got me to where I am now. It's, it's that just learning how things work and understanding even though that stuff is very basic you have power cable you have a couple av cables you have a composite cable of yellow uh video and two audio signals and you just plug those in and you turn it on and it works but looking at the dreamcast looking at it says windows ce what does that even mean to a kid you know this this video game console is powered by windows what like I didn't understand our, uh, computer architecture at that point in my life. And it got me to start questioning and reading up on some of this stuff. And with that adapter, that modem that came with the Dreamcast, allowing you to dial up and make an internet connection and have a web browser on that thing was incredibly new, interesting, 
insane. And it got me to start learning technology and architecture and how the internet worked because the internet was still very much a very new thing to a lot of people. You had web browsers, you had AOL, which was the most common place. There was Netscape and there was Opera, I believe, but most people and Internet Explorer, but most people didn't have a real grasp on that until the turn of the century. And so in 1999, being able to connect a video game console to the Internet and play online was insanely new. And also being able to have um, a game like Sonic, uh, Sonic Adventure where you could connect and rip uh, or pull down basically the earliest version of downloadable content and change the hub world of Sonic Adventure from uh, just its normal environment to on Halloween, having everything spooky and spiders and spider webs and creepy lanterns and uh, pumpkin heads and all this aesthetic just for a day of the year. And then also being able to have it connect on um, Christmas and have everything snowing and covered in white snow and um, Christmas carols and, and music playing in the background of, of Christmas, Christmas car- uh, carols and stuff like that. Dude, it was a new thing back then. It's crazy to think how how much the Dreamcast did ahead of its time. It was a very ahead of its time type of console. And unfortunately, because of the business practices of Sega back then and and um the way the Dreamcast just wasn't as good or powerful as say the uh, PS2, it died at a very early death. And it's insane because there is some crazy good stuff on the actual uh, Dreamcast. And so I'm just going to talk about a few games that I remember playing. I remember hooking up. I remember renting or owning. And unfortunately, the Dreamcast doesn't really have a very large library. It's a little over 300 uh, games. I think it's like 312 altogether uh, between U.S. and PAL regions. And it's a bummer because there were some really fun games on that system. One of the uh, first games I remember owning was not just uh, Sonic Adventure, but also Trick Style. And Trick Style was a racing game, and I love racing games. Um, but it was a hybrid of racing and um, extreme sports. Basically, you're riding a hoverboard. And man, oh man, when I was a kid, one of my favorite movies of all time, and to this day still, is Back to the Future. And with Back to the Future 2, you have the hoverboard. And that hoverboard was always something I imagined as a kid owning and growing up with and wanting to own and can't not wait until the future happens so that we could all have hoverboards. And obviously that hasn't really happened. The product nowadays, back in 2015, known as a hoverboard, was literally a a skateboard with two wheels in a different orientation. It's a skateboard, and and it pissed me off to no end when when that term hoverboard was used for that stupid piece of crap because it's dumb and it's terrible and it's not a hoverboard. There's literally nothing about it that you hover with. <sighs> That's a rant for another day. Sorry, but basically the hoverboard was something that I wanted to own, and so having a video game really explore the hoverboard concept for the first time. Because there was Back to the Future games on the uh, NES, and boy, oh boy, those are not good games. There was a Super Nintendo Super Back to the Future game, but it was only released in Japan, and so we never really had that there. And you're basically Marty, and you're glued to the hoverboard, and it's just kind of a very basic game. You play the game once, you play the first level, you've seen basically the entire game. But with Trick Style, it's a hub-like element with racing and you have a trick area, and you're on a hoverboard. 
and you get to lay down on it luge style. You get to do a bunch of tricks. You're flipping around very akin to SSX on the PlayStation 2. But what separated this game was it was made by Criterion, the game, uh, the people who made Burnout. And if you've listened to the other episodes, I believe episode four of this podcast, you heard me talk in depth about uh, Criterion and the Burnout series and their new game, Dangerous Driving. Oh, boy, that's why I loved Trick Style. And talk to people nowadays and they'll go, oh, Trick Style, oh, that's a dumb game. That's terrible. It's not a terrible game. It just had some flaws. Like any game. That's the thing. Every game has flaws. But not all games are amazing. But not all games are absolute trash either. There's very few cases where games are absolutely not worth your time. Trick style is game worth your time. How much time? Maybe not a whole lot. But it's definitely not a bad game. So... With trick style, basically you're racing around levels and it had like um, a a, a level where you were racing through like a futuristic uh, version of Central Park and stuff like that. And what I really like about the Dreamcast is that it has a very different feel to the way games are played and the way the characters are created and animated. There's a very circular, rounded structure. To these characters, go crack open a game, uh, a game from the Dreamcast, and compare it to its, let's say, PS One or PS Two counterpart, like um, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Even take the original PlayStation version of Tony Hawk One, and compare it to the Dreamcast version of Tony Hawk One, and you will feel a very distinct difference. The physics are a little bit different. They feel a little bit tweaked, but it's mainly the character models. There's a smoothness that the Dreamcast introduced because of how powerful it was and the way the polygons were um, created. It's unlike anything else. It's, It's a very weird feeling to go from PS1 to Dreamcast, even though it's the exact same game. I played it last night. And I went, wow, this is, I forgot how different this feels, even though it's the exact same game. You can crack o- or uh, o- open up the warehouse ep- uh, level and start skating and do the two minute run on the warehouse. The first level, Tony Hawk 1. And even though you'll be able to do every trick the exact same way, everything will, the music will be the same. The graphics are just a little bit different. The physics feel just a little bit different but not in a bad way. Not from like Sonic uh, the Hedgehog 2 or or 3 or Sonic Knuckles or Sonic CD to Sonic Adventure. Not in a weird way, but in a different way. And that's what I loved about the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast was different. It was something special compared to everything else out there. And this, remember, this is 1999. This is before PS2 even launched. Here in America. And so, man, the Dreamcast just had just a crazy amount of special features, special games that you couldn't get anywhere else. And another reason why I love the Dreamcast so much and why it's my favorite console of all time is because it is so closely based in its hardware ca- or uh, hardware arcade counterpart. <laughs> The Dreamcast is basically an arcade in a very small form factor. And take a look at the games that are on the system. Games like uh, Ikaruga and Crazy Taxi and House of the Dead 2. These were arcade games that you could get at home for a much smaller price and a very small form factor and have basically the same experience. Crazy Taxi, man. (laughs) This was another game that blew my mind as a kid. This game influenced me on such a deep level with driving, the arcade, music. Everything about this game spoke to me as a kid. From the moment the announcer 
Hey, 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 welcome to Crazy Taxi. Let's get ready to make some crazy money. These are the things that just made me love this system. It had a personality. It was dripping with personality versus the very bland approach, for me anyways, of the PlayStation 2. The PlayStation 2 seemed like a very corporate style type of game system. It was something where it was like, oh yeah, a bunch of boardroom members made this game, uh, this system. It's very square, very angular, very box-like. But with the Dreamcast, it's got curves. It's got um, sh- uh, points and uh, edges that you just don't see on any other console system design. And even just the outside of it just screamed, hey, look at us. We're different. We're new. We're exciting. We are something else compared to everyone else. And that's why I love the Dreamcast. Crazy Taxi is a perfect example of that. You're a taxi driver and you're trying to make money. Bam, there's the um, you know uh, elevator pitch of that game. But what it does and the music, everyone knows. You start a Crazy Taxi, you say, hey, what's the music in Crazy Taxi? Everyone goes, the offspring, all I want. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that is Crazy Taxi. Everyone knows it. Everyone loves it. And that punk rock style of um, the early 2000s, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, Offspring is a perfect match. And even with the corporate sponsorships of, hey, take me to KFC, take me to Tower Records, you know, um, of the Crazy Taxi uh, universe, and, and having those sponsorships, it still makes it unique. It still makes it fun. It's an arcade game. There's something about arcade games that you just don't get with something on the PS2. That's why the Dreamcast was so cool. It was something different. So you have the crazy taxi where all you're trying to do is drive around and make money and pick people up and drop them off at various places. And again, then you have ports like the Tony Hawk franchise or Dave Mira. The Dave Mira BMX game feels very, very, very different. And I tried playing this and I got to stick with it a little bit if I want to keep playing it because there's a speed (laughs) to Dave Mira on Dreamcast that the PlayStation version does not have. And that's what was really cool about the Dreamcast is it, it gave you ports of older games or even newer games because, again, this was, you know, at the same time. But you got, them, you got the PlayStation 1 version and they skipped the PS2 versions for the most part. You didn't have Tony Hawk 1, 2, or th- uh, 1 or 2 on PlayStation 2. You only had them on PlayStation 1. And then you had a Dreamcast version, which was our modern version of remakes. You know, you have these HD remakes. Everyone's making, making HD remakes nowadays. nowadays. The Dreamcast was the one who really did that. Back then, back in 1999, there was HD remakes of PlayStation games on the Dreamcast. With Dave Mira, it's just, it, 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 like I was talking about before, that physics, that physics is so different compared to the PlayStation 1 version. Maybe it's like the warping um, textures and all that stuff that the PlayStation like it just has a real hard time with, which is why, or one of the reasons why PlayStation games are so hard to go back to now, that PlayStation Classic, it's not good. Everyone goes, oh, these games look a way worse. Yeah, they do. Why? Because of those hardware limitations from 1994, 95. That's the hardware that is in that 1995 version of PlayStation 1 is old, old technology, original 3D hardware, uh, 3D programming, stuff like that. It's going to be weird. It's going to be different. So when we got the Dreamcast and we got updated resolutions and textures and and updated versions of these games that we loved that's another reason why the dreamcast was so cool you had a couple wrestling games on there but they weren't anything good like the uh aki versions of um 
WCW NWO Revenge or uh, No Mercy or WrestleMania 2000. These were the bad acclaim games. So I didn't, never really played any of those because I didn't care. I hated them for the most part. You had a game like Power Stone, which was very similar to the Smash Brothers games, but it had we- or it had different um, abilities where you could grab the Power Stones and, and change. And it was more of a fun party game, which I really liked. Then you had games like Ready to Rumble. Man, a boxing game that... I don't care who you are. If you look at Ready to Rumble Boxing on the Dreamcast, again, you know it's dripping with personality. It is something so different from the time of Knockout Kings and... um those other games that were just trying to be as realistic as possible, and they're just boring. They're just bad. So you get something like Ready to Rumble Boxing, and you have Afro Thunder, and, um, oh, man, Boris Nakamov and Lulu Valentine, and um, who are the other ones? I can't remember. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a bunch of other characters in those games, and they're animated in such a fun and unique way when people get hit bruises start appearing you didn't see that on the other consoles because the hardware didn't allow you to and even on ps2 a year later when that launched it was very different than what we got in a launch game and i played these games at launch because what was really cool again about this system was that it had a pack in. It was called the generator disc, and it was basically a uh, a demo disc, and it had demos of like every single, almost every single launch game on the console. And how cool is that? That not only do you get this crazy new hardware, and not only you get one or two launch games to play with and and own and keep. But you get demos of all the other games so that if you want to later on, you can play, play around with it when you're done playing the one or two games that you got at launch. And you can try out at home for free the kiosk demos, basically. Instead of going to Target, you get to play it at home. These demo discs with all the other games on there. So you could go, oh, man, well, I, can't, I don't have any extra money for, uh, from my birthday or from... Uh, chores and allowance or whatever, you get to play those games without having to spend the money um, or wait. And that was just such a novel thing back then. I miss demo discs, man. They were so cool. They're so important to gaming. As a kid, nowadays, you know, we're all grown up. We have lives and jobs and we can pretty much buy whatever we want whenever we want. But there is something special about trying a game before you buy it. That's why I, what I, I did what I did at Games For You is try before you buy. If there's a game you're really on the fence about and you go, man, I just wish I could play this game a little bit to kind of know. And this was back before the YouTube, you know, retro great gaming era really blew up. I would let people play games before they bought them to make sure that they really did want these games and weren't just going to playing for five minutes get that nostalgia hit and then leave so and be bummed out so the dreamcast was uh, another proponent in that demo disc era which we don't have anymore games just don't have demos anymore and it's a bummer you have uh, games like jet grind radio which again just had such an a different aspect to that game it had a feeling to that game that said we are making games because we want to not because we have to not because some corporate entity is designing this game by boardroom but because we want to that's why i love video games it's another style of art and i'm a very big believer in making something because you want to same thing with this podcast i'm not doing I'm not trying to grow a fan base or beg for money or start a Patreon or any of that crap. It's 
because I want to do something artistic. That's the only reason why this is happening. And when I feel that I'm done, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to cater to other people. I'm making the things that I want to make because I want to make them. And that's what the Dreamcast did. It made games because the people who made them wanted to make something and make something interesting and cool. Yes, there are bad games. Yes, there are yearly franchises in these, it, 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 even on the Dreamcast. But they were artistic in nature. They said something different. They didn't do it because they had to. They did it because they wanted to. And that's a very big difference. And yeah, you'll see something like the motocross games or something like that or um, the NFL games. But even then, the NFL games, oh my gosh, I'm not even a football fan. And holy crap, these games are amazing. The 2K series gave birth on this system and they started on this system and they are totally, again, completely different from the rest of the pack. It was different than Madden. It didn't feel very, it still hasn't. If you go back and play now, yeah, you can definitely see like it's adhering to the NFL license and blah, 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 and all that stuff. But it still felt different. It felt new. It felt exciting. And man, that 2K series, there's a reason 2K isn't around anymore for football anyways. It's because it was so stinking good and did so well that the Madden series, EA had to kill it with exclusivity. They killed that other franchise because it did so well and it put a spotlight on the Madden series and going, look at this new series and look how good and refreshing and fun and energetic and enjoyable this is versus the Madden series, which is stale and very um, stagnant in the way it's played. It is a very by the books and by the numbers type of gameplay uh, creativity wise. And it's very, it, it feels like it was made by a boardroom as opposed to a person who wanted to create something. So those games, even those games, and I hate sports games for the most part, those games did something different. The 2K series was so fresh and unique and fun. Oh, man, I, I cannot believe it's such a bummer that those games don't exist anymore because I probably play a football game. Luckily, we had Blitz, <laughs> um, which is my personal preferred. I like hyper-realistic uh, sports games or cartoon, or more cartoony, fake, fun, arcade-style games as opposed to realistic simulation games. I think simulation games, for the most part, are very boring. You also had ports like Marvel vs. Capcom and Marvel Super Heroes. <laughs> How did these games get created back then, man? Like, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, one of the greatest fighting games of all time, is on the Dreamcast in nowhere else for a long time. And then it came to the Xbox and it came to PS2. But this port, man, is there's something unique and something special about it. And especially at the time, too. If you wanted to play a fighting game, that was the fighting game you had. You also had, you know, uh, Soul Calibur, which I, again, I said I did not really play back in the day. I was not a fan of Soul Calibur, but I do appreciate it. I love the fact that those games exist. And I got really into Soul Calibur too, but I never really got into Soul Calibur on the Dreamcast. And maybe it was just because I didn't want to plop $60 down on a fighting game that I couldn't play with anyone else. Again, Andrew was the only one who, of my friends who really played video games at that point. And he lived kind of far away when we were in high school. He lived in, I think it was called Robinson Ranch. And that was a good long bike ride for me. And that was before I had a bicycle or a, a car and a license. So I could not drive to his house whenever I wanted to. It was either our parents dropped us off or we carpooled from school or whatever. And he went to a different high school at that point. So... I just didn't want to plop down 60 bucks on a fighting game that I would not really have fun with, which is a bummer because I really like those. Um, 
I talked a little bit about Power Stone, talked about Rumble to, Ready to Rumble Boxing. Um, there was a game that I never really played, and I always wanted to, but it was Samba de Amigo. Samba de Amigo is a rhythm-based game, and I'm not very good at rhythm-based games, but man, and talk about something out of this world, something that's so unique and different than anything else out there. Go look up Samba de Amigo. Get the Maracas controllers, plug them into your Dreamcast, and just have fun. Man, that is a fun game. San Francisco Rush 2049. Again, another episode that I talked about on the racing game episodes. Or another game. Um, And the Rush series has always held a dear place in my heart. And this game did something different. It was the arcade game, but it added the stunt mode and added wings. Wings aren't in the arcade version of Rush 2049. But they're in the console version. And so you get to do all the fun jumps and loops and all the stuff the Rush series is known for, the low gravity of the cars flying through the air. But you get to course correct in the middle of it or create spins and flips and stuff like that and have just a little bit more fun, which makes this game just, again, unique. That is, if I had to... If I had to describe the place to or the uh, Dreamcast in one word, it would probably be unique. It's different. It's unique. It's something that you don't get with a PlayStation 2. Sonic Adventure was a blast. Soul Calibur was a blast. They had a Spider Man game. I never really played that because I played it on the PS2 and I already owned it and beat it. So I wasn't going to play more. They had a lot of Street Fighter games, which was really cool. Again, not really a fighting person. There was also another racing game that they had, which was um, called Speed Demons. And whew, Speed Demons was, again, something cool. Rush 2049 did this as well. Is while you were driving, the course would change a little bit after every lap. And so with Speed Demons, I remember there was this one level where you're driving through the country on the first lap and then the, there's a tornado that happens and you see this tornado off in the distance, you get closer and closer and then you're kind of flying through the tornado, running through barns as it's being ripped apart by the tornado. It was kind of like living the, the, the game, or sorry, the movie Twister in game form, which was really cool. And the last game I'll talk about, Toy Commander. And this game holds a really special place in my heart because I never owned it. And I'm so bummed that I never owned it as uh, when I was younger. I rented it multiple times, though. Toy Commander is basically Toy Story in video game form. You take control of these vehicles and toys in a household environment, and so the scale is all skewed up. You are a very small a little tiny airplane or a tank or a boat. And you're trying to do stuff in a house. So like the first level, you're in an airplane and you got to fly through the kitchen, collect gas cans so that you don't run out of fuel, land on the stove, and there is a couple eggs that need to be dropped into a boiling pot of water. So you fly around, turn the knob to turn the stove on, boil the water, and then knock land on this cutting board and roll these eggs into the boiling pot of water and you're doing this uh with uh other airplanes chasing you or a cat that's trying to knock you out of the air or you know various other things there's another level where you turn on the the sink the sink gets clogged and fills up the entire uh kitchen with water and so you, now you're trying to shoot down enemy boats that have flooded the kitchen and stuff. It's, it's incredible. It's such a fun and unique game that doesn't happen anywhere else other than the Dreamcast. So the Dreamcast is something super special to me. It's, it's my favorite console of all time. It's a game system that... While I was moving into that high school mindset, coming from junior high, learning to become 
you know, my own self, you know, I guess, or whatever you want to call it, learning how to mature and and think a little bit more maturely and really going, who, who am I as a person? I'm Ryan. I am the person who likes video games, who played the Mario series when I was younger, but now I want to graduate to something different. I want to move up to something new and a little bit more um, adult in nature. And the Dreamcast was the perfect console for me at that time, where it still had the fun, enjoyable aspects of video games, but also took them more seriously at the same time. Said, video games are not just licensed properties to be shilled out to dumb kids in, whose parents will pay money for these dumb video games like Bone Storm. It's a system that said, hey, Video games are fun. Video games can be unique. Video games are an art form. We have our creators making these games for the people who are like them. And that's maybe what drew me to the Dreamcast, what keeps me going back to the Dreamcast every once in a while. And it was just a fun, solid piece of technology that allowed you to experience arcade games, experience Japanese games that were unlike anything else at the time. People always talk about Katamari Damacy. And the Katamari games, I love. Man, I played through those games at the tail end of last year and the beginning of this year, and I have a much better appreciation for them than I did back then because all back then it was, oh, Katamari is the weird Japanese game. It's not just weird Japanese. There's something to those games. But the Dreamcast did that back in 2000, uh, 1999. So... That's my little birthday Dreamcast uh, episode for this time. Happy birthday to me. My birthday's tomorrow, September 9th. Or sorry. (laughs) Today's September 9th. My birthday is September 10th. So I'm going to be having fun playing some Dreamcast games for the rest of the day for my birthday. And maybe tomorrow as well. Thank you very much for listening. I always appreciate uh, anyone who... um, likes video games or likes listening to me talk about video games if you have any questions comments or concerns you can either email me catch me online um, go visit the website i'm posting a lot of uh reviews and articles of just fun stuff that i've been thinking about or older articles that i wrote years ago that i'm just kind of getting around to posting online now like i said this is an art form for me this is my creativity outlet so thank you very much for listening And I'll catch you next time on the Game or Die podcast. All right, it's time to check out how you did today. Now let's take a look. A class B license. Decided to play it safe, huh? Come back next time and show us your best. Game over.